and this is how exciting, how simply stimulating for want of a better word. Uh, our idea of freedom was when it was first had. And the first, I suppose, is the king of that thought. It's Hegel. Now Hegel is one of those philosophers. Um, he's famously a little difficult. Uh, but he's not really difficult. It's just you have to get the point of him. Right at the heart of him is this idea of a dialectic. And a dialect can be summarised in lots of kind of stupid ways. I've once summarised it in three sounds, O or Ma. <coughs> oh, I've solved the problem. Mmm, it's a bit more difficult. Ah, I've got a solution. <laughs> but, if you're not going to do it in three sounds, you can actually understand it as a very sophisticated argument. When you first start thinking, one of the odd things is how easy things are. Solutions are everywhere. You've solved it! And then you think a little bit longer, and actually it starts to feel hard again. Um, and it's only then You've got a chance of really thinking and really solving it. And that's the dialect. And actually, that's a good idea. And the other thing about Hegel is he tends to write his books like that. And when I'm reading him, I always have a personal dialectic of my own with Hegel. And I hope to capture that from this piece. Because when I'm reading him, I don't know if you've read Hegel, the first time you read him, you think, oh my god, I'm just never going to understand this. My head's exploding, it's so obscure. And then you kind of get the point of it. And then you think, well, why? <laughs> and it's only then that you get the subtlety about the way he's saying it. So I hope to catch him. <laughs> and the other thing about Hegel, and what's going to allow me to do this, is he was a famously bad lecturer. So I'm going to try and be a famously bad lecturer. Let's <laughs> go back to my glasses. This is from um, the introduction to the philosophy of right. Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. We are here tonight to talk about freedom. What is freedom? Well, you can't touch it, can you, with all the freedom, man? You can't taste it. It's not an intuition thing. No. But can you understand it? Possess it? Own it? Have it? Clearly not. So it isn't a concept. So what is it? I think the answer is, I think the answer is that it must be an idea, a platonic idea, the kind of idea that exists across the ages, that we all share. But if it is a platonic idea, it must be present here. Present, but not yet prescient. Here lies then the holy task of our philosophy. Gentlemen, to turn that which is merely before us and all to foreknowledge for us all. But then where do we start our inquiry? At first, I'm sure it seems simple. If I say to you, are you free because you are who you are, or are you free only as you are refracted in another's eyes? It seems so simple. No doubt you say, I am free, I am myself. I am free as I am conscious agent. I am free, and my freedom is indivisible, unique, personal. And I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. As long as you also are abstract, impotent, and in the end, enslaved to the moment. Take even the highest maxim of personal responsibility. The so-called the so-called golden principle. Do unto others as you would have done to yourself. What really? What really? Isn't that going to turn freedom into individual penchant? Where we're all caught in the moment of the desire. <laughs> in each desire, no doubt, we're free to follow our slavery. But that is not freedom. How then, gentlemen, are we going to become truly free without becoming first moral. The world of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Is this your freedom? Hmm. Or is it just another name for compulsion? Categorical imperatives, can't, no. How do you become free? Save by this, learning to desire. A truly ethical thing. A holy thing. But how can you have that freedom? 
How can you gain that right? Say through your society, your culture, that teaches you not just who you are in the flesh and blood here and now, but rather makes you understand that across the welter of time. That gives you your identity, that opens your mind not to how you are now, but how you might be. To an ocean then of possibility. And at last shows you what you truly are. One thought in a great mind. The geist, not constrained by the presence of flesh and blood, but rather part of one great mind under God. In that thought, in that thought alone, can you become truly free. You will also notice there, just out of interest, the secret of my performing style is not wearing glasses. <laughs> the minute I wear glasses, I lose something. It's because I can see you all, so I... <laughs> so I shall go back to not wearing glasses, if that's alright. Right, I'm going back a generation, he mentioned it in the last one. This is Immanuel Kant. And this is Kant's great essay, What is Enlightenment? Now, Immanuel Kant is a very famous conundrum. Is he the only revolutionary in the world, or is he just a reaction? And this is the essay where he puts that problem to philosophy. It's called What is Enlightenment? And you have to know when it's written. It's written about 1780, something or other. And so that's after the American Revolution, before the French Revolution, during the Scientific Revolution, during the German Enlightenment. And you can hear all those threads running straight through this piece. <clears throat> so, what is this word? This holy thing? The Enlightenment you hear on every man's lips. I, Immanuel Kant, will tell you, my friends. What is the Enlightenment but mankind finally growing up and learning to look at the world not as he wants it to be, not as idle whim and fancy would have it, but as it is, and learning then to think for himself. For it is so hard to think, is it not? Everywhere there is that idleness of spirit, a certain lassitude of our nature that makes us dread thought. An idleness that the self-appointed guardians of our youth connive with as they whisper and weasel words, don't worry about it, just believe what we tell you. <laughs> don't think for yourself, because if you think, you might be wrong. And wouldn't that be humiliating? And to all these voices I say, no, no, I am going to have the courage to I'm going to have the commitment to share my thoughts. And I'm going to have the bravery to publish not just my successes, but also my failures, so that we may all learn by it. And yet, gentlemen, do you not see what is going to happen between us and the rest, those of us who will enlighten ourselves, and the rest who will stay in the old ways of thoughts? Will not a great chasm open up? And how wide that will become in time, who knows? Maybe in future times, generations will rise up to try to shut us up, to make us be quiet. And yet we must not be quiet. <laughs> but there is no surprise in any of this. Everywhere you hear them, the same voices. Don't argue, just get on the parade ground, says the soldier. Don't worry about it, just vote for me says the politician. Don't think, just read and believe, says the journalist. <laughs> and yet to these voices I say, no, I am going to worry about it, I am going to think. And what is more, you are going to feel grateful for it, for we are all strengthened by my inquiry. So much is so. And yet, my friends, is it not written in the greatest of books? A time to live, a time to think, a time to act. <laughs> if we are going to then be truly grown up about this, we must realise something. After all, what price a soldier in a battlefield who stands up and says, Hello, I've got a better idea! Even if he's right, he'll be shot and betray his regiment. For well, what price? And the government minister who doesn't like a policy resigns and brings down a government and so ruins all his hopes. For what price a man who doesn't pay his taxes? You don't pay your taxes, you imperil your state. And then you get the true freedom of bloody anarchy. 
No, don't you see? If we are going to be really grown up about this, we might argue as public citizens, but as private individuals, we must conform. But in case this feels too hard a fate for you to bury, remember this. Who is the best person to enact some iniquitous policy? A zealot who means it? Hmm. Or a man who finds some other things to say. Some other humanity. And remember also this. No future generations, nay, no decade, scarcely one year, has the right to dictate the thoughts of those that follow. <clears throat> Conform now, but always argue for your vision. And what is the role of rulers in this new world of ours? They must listen to the debate, use it to form their minds, and act. But more than that, they must jealously guard our right to argue. For in it lies their strength. They must guard it, I say, from the mob or from the rich man who will buy up opinion, buy up influence. They must guard it. Because it, and in it alone, lies our enlightenment. We will not be enlightened as an individual sitting under a tree, leaping up and declaring we alone are enlightened. Nay! Our enlightenment is a process. It will take centuries. And we might always lose it. And so return to the long agony of our childhood. This then is our enlightenment. We must learn to say with the most enlightened and wisest of modern monarchs. Argue as much as you like, but in the end you obey. Because it is only in obeying you are truly free. What a price of freedom based on action? My freedom to act is often enough merely my right to oppress you. True freedom lies in my ability to make you change your mind, in your ability to make me see I am wrong. Hold on to that, and our enlightenment is saved. Lose it, and it is as good as lost.